Ah, good morning. Well, I was just speaking with the lady, uh, the, the neighbor lady there. She's on her way into town to pick up the the stuff for Rocky there to restore Alex. So hopefully that will help him. Um, yeah, I want to touch on something today. I'm going to tell you a story from my past. Um, uh, I did make a video before about this. But I took it down because it caused some issues in my family. There's one family member in particular who has um, rewritten history in her mind as to what happened in order that she can she can live with it, and um, and the role that she played. And so, and then another family member who didn't know all the details saw the video and became furious with the first family member who was rewritten history and is denying that whatever role and so on so it's i um i um ended up i i put it uh, i just took the video down because it had caused friction um anyway here here's the thing i'm going to tell you the story here in 1982 i went to live with my dad and my stepmother. Uh, my dad and my stepmother both had their own issues. My dad was an alcoholic. He could be quite violent at times. He was a good guy in a lot of ways. He was honest. He worked hard, really hard worker. He paid his bills. His word was good. Um, but he was an old-fashioned tough guy. You know, he was like a 1950s tough guy. And... Um, he could be quite violent at times anyway. If you got on the wrong side of him, he'd have you pinned against the wall, you know, choking the life out of you by your throat, basically. Not not somebody to fool around with. And he was like that. He could be that way with me. He was like that with domestic partners, with wives that he was with, and over the year, women he was with over the years, and so on. And my stepmother was uh well she was again very emotionally disturbed and uh she used to pull knives on us and all sorts of stuff anyway it, it was bad and uh i still can't stand to see a wilshire ever sharp knife if i'm sitting at somebody's kitchen table visiting with them and there's a wilshire ever sharp knife on the counter my eyes just go to that thing i can't take my eyes off it and it disturbs me. When I was working for the auctioneer and we'd clear out houses, every time I saw one of those in the house, I'd throw it in the garbage. I'd throw it away with the trash. I couldn't bring myself to deal with it. I'd just throw it in the trash bag. Even though we could have sold it and got money out of it, it was the only thing I'd do that with, because that was really my boss's money I was messing with by doing that. But every time I saw one of those, it'd just go directly into the trash. I couldn't stand to, to deal with it because my stepmother used to pull that on us, you know. Anyway, I want, I'm not going to get into all the details of what happened, but I'll tell you because it caused a lot of friction before. But I will tell you partly anyway what happened. Um, I was very much a Catholic. When I was 14 years old in 1982 when I lived with my dad and my stepmother. I was extremely Catholic. You know, I always say if Catholicism were an Olympic event, I'd have been a gold medalist. I was that Catholic, you know. And um, so, of course, I didn't miss Mass. And we used to go to Mass on Saturday nights there. I used to go over and meet my grandparents, my dad's parents, who were also very devout Catholic. And we'd go to Mass together. And, um, of course, you didn't go to Mass in those days in your jeans. You know, you wore your suit. You dressed respectfully. That's how it was in those times, you know. There, you, uh, your jeans were for if you were doing some dirty job or if you were just bumming around the house or maybe if you were going for a walk down the street not going any place where you'd have to impress anybody you'd wear your jeans but you didn't wear your jeans to church that's for certain that was a big no-no anyway i put my suit on 
and I'm heading out the door this Saturday evening to head over, walk over to my grandparents' place to meet with them to go to Mass. Stepmother stops me. What's with the suit? I said, well, I'm going to Mass. Well, she freaked out. She didn't like Catholics. She had no use for the Catholic Church, and she freaked out anyway. And she started berating me. Anyway, I told her, well, you know, I'm going to Mass. That's all there is to it. Like, you have no say in the matter. Uh, she pulled the um, Wilshire Eversharp knife out of its holder, and she came at me. Well, I went out the door. I slammed the door behind me to, to slow her down, you know, basically. But she still managed to get right up on my heels. She chased me down the stairs out of the building onto the street. This was one of the main streets in the little town of 6,000 people. And I come out the door with her right behind me with the knife, you know, and roaring her head off, saying, if you ever darken my doorway again, you effing whatever, you know, I will cut you, I will cut you into pieces. If you ever come in, into my house again, into my apartment, I will cut you to pieces. And I'm standing down at the corner, at, at the light there, at the intersection, just looking at her, you know, and she was uh, probably three store lamps down in front of the door that we had to go into to get up into our apartment. And I'm just looking at her like, what, what on earth, <laughs> you know. Anyway, I went over to my grandparents and I told them the story. They already thought she was crazy. And that just sealed it for them. They said, well, you can't go back there. The woman's obviously crazy. You know, can't go back there. Who knows what'll happen. Uh, you're going to stay here until we figure things out. Well, then, my stepmother called the children's aid. I don't know what she told them, but she got the children's aid involved. And I'm thinking she told them a story that favored her anyway. Probably a preemptive thing. I'll call the children's aid before anybody else has a chance to. And anyway, I got the social worker came around to see me. She only saw me the one time. And I had a meeting with her in the parlor at my grandparents' house there in the living room, you know. And uh, basically what she told me was, though she was an older woman. She'd been a social worker since the 1930s, and it was now 1982. Under the old laws that were still in effect in 1982, until you were 16 years old, you had no civil rights. Really, you weren't even a human being. You were property. You were, you were your father's property, really, is what you were. And um, anyway, she put it to me like this. She said, I don't like teenagers. I've had bad experiences dealing with teenagers. I'm not dealing with you. I'm not going to deal with your situation. I'm going to label you incorrigible, and I'm going to send you to the reformatory at King in Kingston. That's what I'm going to do. I'm not going to deal with you at all. And that's what she did. And under the old Juvenile Delinquents Law Act law, which was in effect until June of 1986 in this country, she had that right. The law dated from 1862. That's how old this law was. Any authority figure could label you incorrigible, which meant you were just generally a bad person. You didn't have to have committed a crime or anything, and they could put you in jail. And that's what she did. She put me in jail. Uh, the paperwork had to be done and everything, and, you know, the system don't move real fast. So it was February. It was the first week of February in 1983 that I went to jail. Never got, never stood in front of a judge or anything, just went directly to jail. And I was in jail until the end of August of 1983. And um, things happened in there that I won't talk about. It was a bad place. Um, I talked a little bit about the abuse that I had experienced and that I had seen others experience. Uh, in my first video that I deleted, but I'm not going to do that this time. I break down if I talk about it. It makes me break down. I had nightmares for years after. I used to wake up thinking I was still there and I'd be in a panic. Because in waking up in a dark room thinking I was still there, that went on for years <coughs> afterwards. <clears throat> anyway, 
Um, yeah, yeah. Anyway, you know, that experience, though, it taught me some things, and it toughened me up. It made a man of me is what it did. And it toughened me up for what was coming, for what has come now. You know, the reason that I'm as resistant as I am to the things that are happening now in my country, in Canada, and the reason I'm as defiant of our government as I am <clears throat> is because what I learned when I was in that awful place was this. If you get a few people who have pretty much unbridled power and zero accountability in charge of other people, horrible things happen. And I'm seeing now how my, how my government wants to take away our ability to determine for ourselves how we'll live. They want to tell us where we'll live. They want to tell us how we'll live. They want to tell us what we're allowed to say. They want to tell us what we're allowed to think. They want to tell us what we're, where we're allowed to live, what we're allowed to eat, that we have to put things into our bodies, that we have to wear things on our faces. Um, no, I will not be doing it. I will not be doing it. And that experience at the hands of our government years ago, where I saw firsthand the kind of evil that people are capable of when they have total power and no accountability, that experience, um, that's conditioned me for what's happening now. And I've already paid somewhat of a price. I've paid, I, I have paid the price for refusing to cooperate. Right now, I can't go to a hospital. If I get badly injured here, if I slip on the ice and I fall and break my leg, that's a death sentence. When I'm working at the neighbors, if I hurt myself using a chainsaw or anything like that, that's a death sentence for me. I'll get no help because I'm non-compliant with certain things our government is pushing. And I've already been through this. I've already been ordered to leave the hospital and told I'm not allowed to be there because I'm non-compliant. We've had people in this country die because they're non-compliant and they were denied medical treatment. So yeah, anyway, that's where we're at. Oh, there's some neighbors there who are riding across. Um, nice people, I've seen them before. Um, yeah, anyway, sometimes they do that. They go across on a four-wheeler. Like I say, very nice people. Um, anyway, that, that's the reason, anyway, that I, that I don't comply with this stuff because I see where it's headed. I see the kind of power our government wants, and I know how evil that can be. And I, I think unless you've been through an experience like I've been through, you can't understand how bad it really is. You know, <clears throat> you can't understand how bad things can get. So, that's it anyway. Anyway, that's it for now. Um, I hope you're all doing well. Um, I'm doing pretty good, all things considered. I'll keep you updated on Rocky. I'll let you know if the Restore Relax works. If it doesn't, well, then the next step will be to start the process of getting him into the vet. I don't know how long that'll take. 